birthday. My clock shows four o'clock central time. So I think we will go ahead and get started. Looks like we've got about 93 participants online. So welcome to everybody. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, my name is Aaron Harries. I'm Vice President of Research and Operations with Kansas Wheat and uh, welcome to our version of the 2020 online wheat tour. Uh, glad you could join us. I'm coming to you live from the Kansas Wheat Innovation Center in Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, most of you have heard by now that the regular wheat tour hosted by the Wheat Quality Council had to be canceled uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's a wise decision, of course. Um, this online tour is not any attempt to replicate what happens on the wheat tour. Um, we're hopeful that the in-person tour will be able to resume in 2021. Uh, the goal of this tour is to kind of to provide a current snapshot of the Kansas wheat crop and as well we'll have updates from Nebraska, Colorado, and Oklahoma uh, through the next few afternoons. So uh, the USDA crop numbers came out last week but obviously some things have changed since that data was collected. Uh, this is a crucial time of the year in development of the crop and many things can affect the final results between now and harvest. Um, so how is this going to work since we can't take a large group of people around the state in a caravan of, of cars like the regular wheat tour. Um, what we've done is invited some volunteers and experts to help us locally to go out and take some yield estimates. So these include uh, certified crop advisors, uh, K-State research and extension personnel. Uh, representatives from the ag retail and grain handling industry and leadership and staff of Kansas Wheat. So we believe this group will do uh, an excellent job of providing some unbiased yield data for the tour. Uh, some of you may not be familiar uh, with the Kansas Certified Crop Advisor Program. Um, it's um, a large group that was established in uh, 1992 uh, it validates the credentials of professional crop advisors by establishing standards for those groups. Uh, CCAs must pass a rigorous state and national exam and earn continuing education credits to maintain their certification. So there are over 350 CCAs across Kansas uh, scattered all across the state. And their professional agronomic credentials um, make them a perfect fit to collect uh, our wheat yield data. Uh, so we certainly thank the Certified Crop Advisor Program for their support. Uh, also big thanks to K-State Research and Extension for lending us their expertise. We've identified uh, with cooperation through them, several agents and agronomists around the states who will also be doing yield estimates. Um, also thank you to uh, Doug Bounds with USDA uh, Ag Statistics Service for updating the yield formula that our volunteers will use. And we'll share that with you here in a little bit. Um, I do want to um, go through the schedule just a little bit here. Uh, let's see if I can get out of this. Um, and, and bear with me on this. We're we're going to have some technical technical difficulties just because of the guy running the uh, running the program here. Um, the schedule for the next few days looks like this. Uh, today we're just going to do an introduction and, and tour overview um, of what the crop looks like. We'll have some of the basics of review of the 2020 crop until this point in the year. Uh, Romulo Lolato with K State will do that. Uh, we'll get a wheat disease update. There's a lot of disease pressure out there right now. Eric DeWolf and Kelsey Anderson with K-State will be given a preview of that. And then we'll have yield formula and questions uh, as we wrap up today. We're going to try to keep each of these sessions to an hour or, or 90 minutes max. Uh, tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock, we're going to be joined by Roy Shaneman with Nebraska and Brad Urker with Colorado to give us a report on some wheat estimates that they deal in their states recently. Uh, Jeannie Falk Jones uh, with K-State Extension is going to give us a report on Northwest Kansas. And then we'll have reports about what we saw today. And if the technology allows, we hope to have, uh, like Romlo, give a live report from a field to show you actual some of the wheat conditions, 
uh, as his internet allows. We'll try to do that the next several days. A similar program on, on uh, the 20th, on Wednesday, we'll have a report from Oklahoma, uh, from Mike Schulte with the Oklahoma Wheat Commission. Uh, Gary miller Shasky, one of our commissioners in uh, West Central and Southwest Kansas, will give us a report on conditions out there. And we'll finish the day with uh, yield numbers, again, that range of estimates. Um, and then on Thursday, uh, Dave Green with the Wheat Quality Council will provide us a report on some of the wheat in Central Kansas. Uh, again, an update on what we saw during the day, and we'll have numbers and questions at the end of the day, Thursday, and we do plan on putting out an estimate of the total crop production for Kansas. Uh, we'll try and, and get that number for you uh, before we end the seminar on Thursday. So uh, all of you should be muted on, on this part of the program. Uh, we, we do intend to uh, um, let you submit questions through chat and we'll try to answer as many of those questions as we can uh, throughout the course of, of the afternoon. So uh, just a couple more things. I'll turn it over to Romlo. Again, thanks to our, our volunteers, our crop advisors uh, with CCA, K-State, and our Kansas Wheat Board members. Uh, this is the tour plan on uh, day one. On Tuesday, we're going to have reports from the North Central and Northwest Kansas districts on day two from West Central and Southwest Kansas. Then on day three, we're gonna have reports um, from Central, South Central, and hopefully a little bit from, from Eastern Kansas also. So uh, just a quick review for those of you maybe not familiar with Kansas, uh, where the wheat is. Uh, the wheat is mostly grown in the central and western part of the state. The red buttons there, we've got Manhattan highlighted, uh, Wichita and South Central Kansas. Uh, and Colby in Northwest Kansas, or that might be Goodland. Um, but you can see that most of the wheat is, is localized in, in Central and Western Kansas with the high concentration of that um, in South Central Kansas. I did wanna bring up a map of, uh, this is kind of a neat map that Ag Statistics does uh, through their website. So you're looking at a map of, of Kansas here and what you wanna look at here, these dots each represent a field of some kind. Uh, the brown color is wheat fields. Um, this bright yellow color is corn and the green color is soybeans. Now, as I slide this slider, you're seeing 2019. So once again, here's 2009 and 2019. You don't see my map. This is Marlo, we're not seeing the map. Okay, well, let's let's do this. Now, can you see it? No, not yet. No. Hmm. It, you Let's, have two monitors, Aaron. Maybe you're showing the wrong monitor. Yeah, I'll try it again. We'll see what comes up. Nothing? Uh, not yet. It just says you're screen sharing, but it doesn't have your screen showing. Okay, well, we'll try to, we'll try to pull it that later. Is, is my PowerPoint shown again? No. No, it's black. Well, that's interesting. Oh, there's now we the... Well, we, we have saw the map for a minute. Okay. Is it back? Maybe we just need to be patient for a second. It says you're screen sharing, but we uh, don't see anything quite yet. should be up there now. Okay, are you guys seeing the screen now? Nothing yet. Hmm.
Any luck now? No. Huh. Nothing yet. Okay. Well, I think what I'm going to do is um, just try to turn it over to Romulo right now since um, we'll see if we can get his his screen up there and um, he'll have better stuff to say anyhow. Um, okay. Romlo, you should be able to get up there and share. Hi, Aaron. Um, I guess, could you just make sure that the Lolato one is the host so I can, now we made Romulo host. Sorry, I have two out there just to make things a little bit more confusing. Okay. All right. You should be good to go. Okay, can you guys see the screen here? Let's give it one second, see if it's going to. There you go. Okay, it seems like uh, there's possibly a, a delay there yeah. between when we are sharing here and, and what the Zoom is actually showing. Um, so let's see, let's make sure that uh, things are going. The audio is, is a little bit offset from the, from the screen sharing here, it seems like. Okay, so let's uh, let's give it a try. So, uh, so first, thank you, Aaron, for the invitation to be here talking to the folks uh, today, and welcome everyone. Uh, usually, we do this live and in person, and, and it is a lot of fun. Uh, but due to the circumstances, uh, we're we're glad that we were able to do this by Zoom like this. So, uh, really, the the intention of this presentation here is uh, just twofold. One, just a quick overview on on wheat growth stage ID and how we go about looking at this on the field. Uh, and then the second one, we will take a look at the 2020 wheat crop conditions. Uh, and what have we seen so far really since the fall? Now, um, as we move into the, the first part of the presentation here, uh, wheat growth stage ID, um, you guys can see this chart, uh, which, is, which tells a little bit of the story of how the Kansas wheat uh, crop grows and develops uh, throughout the fall, winter, and spring, right? So typically it's planted there in September, October. Uh, it goes through what we call winter dormancy where really there's not much going on there other than the crop is meeting some cold temperature requirements. Uh, and then about uh, sometime in March, depending where in the year, even late February, it might take on spring growth, uh, go through the reproductive phase uh, about April or May, it gets to where we call the boot stage. Uh, that boot stage is when the head is, try is being pushed up in the stem and almost getting out of the, the world of the plant. Uh, and during May and June, it goes through grain filling and, and then ripening. So uh, with these stages in mind, where is the Kansas wheat crop this year? And to have an idea of how far along the crop is, we can actually take a look at the amount of temperature that was accumulated from the beginning of the year. And that's what you see in this map here. So essentially uh, we have the temperature accumulated since January and the approximate growth stage that the crop has at those different temperature levels, right? And so uh, in the Northwest part of the state, for example, we're estimating that the crop might be getting to that flag leaf emergence uh, stage. As we move uh, south and east from there, it will be a little bit further ahead, uh, getting to boot or even heading stages. Uh, as we get to South Central, uh, heading and flowering and Southeast Kansas, beginning of the grain field stage. 
Now, this is an estimation, right? And of course, several things affect these, especially uh, when the crop was planted, can really affect these being later or earlier than, than what these, uh, these stages are showing here in the map. But just so we have an idea of what we look like when we go into the field, we have a couple of, of photos here to, to share. Of course, if you are a grower, you already know these on top of your head, but perhaps we have some folks out there uh, in the audience right now that are not familiar with. So perhaps as we get to Northwest Kansas, we might see some of these earlier crops or later crops here, uh, uh, what we call stem elongation, right? That stem, uh, the head is pushing, is being pushed through uh, inside that stem and, and being and moved upwards. Uh, we might see some fields that are uh, fully emerged, where the flag leaf, which is the last leaf, as you can see in that photo, is fully emerged. And that's an important stage as well because that flag leaf is responsible for uh, a lot of the photosynthesis that go into the grain. So it's a very important stage of the wheat uh, crop and wheat development. A lot of the crop in north central Kansas is probably going to be at that stage. Um, as we go more towards central Kansas and perhaps uh, the southeast part of the state as well, the crop is going to be a little bit further along than, uh, than in the northwest and north central portion of the state. So um, we might be seeing the crop that is at the boot stage, as you can see here, the, uh, that last internode of the crop is going to be, um, uh, it's going to, to have the head inside of it, the head's being pushed upwards, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit thicker than the remaining of the plant, as you can see there. We have these early stages of heading as well, as those uh, arms are coming out of the world of the plant, and as well as fully headed in the right hand side there. Those are probably the majority of the fields that we're going to visit during this week, perhaps some early grain fuel as well. But that's what the crop should be looking like. Uh, now, moving forward to the next portion here, right? We went uh, talking a little bit about the wheat crop conditions. Uh, usually a couple of things that I like to talk about when discussing uh, the conditions of the crop are uh, precipitation and temperature. And those two, actually, uh, uh, I like to look back in the fall. So let's look back and see what happened during the fall, because that really sets the stage for the crop uh, throughout the winter and spring. Uh, and then we're going to look at the entire growing season as well and see how things are looking like. So this is a precipitation summary here from the 1st of September through December 31st. So really the fall and compassing like uh, the, that wheat planting uh, season. And as you see here, uh, it kind of follows the gradient that we expect, right, drier out in the west and, and more moist in the east, especially southeast. But just want to call your attention to the far southwest corner of the state where we had less than two inches of precipitation. And in actually many cases, we had less than one inch of, pre of precipitation in several of those counties. Uh, and, and that's very important. Um, because those dry fall conditions, they don't allow for a good emergence and a good establishment. Now the remaining of the state uh, was looking in a decent amount of moisture at least. If we look at the departure from the normal, uh, again during the fall, this is the graph from September 1st through December 31st departure of the normal. You can see that in that far southwest corner of the state, we were anywhere about three inches or more below our average. So very, very dry conditions in that southwest portion of the state. In the, that spot in central Kansas, we were behind as well during the fall, but it still got anywhere from three to four inches depending on, on the region there. So still uh, allowed for a good emergence. So these dry conditions in the fall, the, the biggest consequence that it has is a delayed emergence of the crop. And so if we look back in some of the status of the crop in southwest Kansas back in December, uh, many times we didn't even have a crop emerged in many of those fields. So growers planted on time, never had any moisture, any precipitation, and so uh, the crop just did not emerge until sometime in that January time frame. Um, and, and that really reduces the yield potential of the crop. So we have some, uh, some photos here that uh, show the condition of the crop in the southwest part of the state as of December of 2020. And as you see, there's really not much there, and, and that was the situation for uh, a large portion of Southwest Kansas. Uh, now, very briefly, I want you to review what that can do to the yields in that part of the state, right, for growers who decide to keep the crop despite the uh, relatively lower yield potential. 
And so I'm going to summarize five years of research data from Garden City, which is in the southwest portion of the state, uh, where uh, the researchers did a, a study looking at delaying planting date. And so just focus on that uh, blue line, which is grain yield. And in the bottom, you have days after October 1st, when the crop was planted. And this is an average of five years. And we see that the crop was planted on time on October 1st. Still, the average of those five years was about 50 bushels per acre on the left-hand side. And for each month that we were delaying uh, crop planting there, uh, the crop, the, the yield was actually being de de decreased in about 10 bushels per acre or so, or so. So I bring this graph up just because it's important within the context of that part, southwest Kansas, where we see uh, a, a very, uh, if the crop here in this graph emerged on February 1st, for example, it would have yielded only 20 bushels per acre compared to a potential of 50 bushels per acre. So um, there's a, a huge importance of planting, not only planting date, but actually the effective emergence date. So far southwest Kansas, we might see some crops that were emerged on the late side. Um, another difference that we have in planting dates for the remaining of the state uh, is really just based on a previous crop. Right. Sometimes uh, growers are able to plant the crop on time for the remaining of the state, including northwest Kansas, central, south central, and north central Kansas. Uh, if they were, for example, following another wheat crop or following a canola crop or perhaps following um, a fallow period, right, a long, uh, a long, long fallow period. And that allowed the crop to have a good canopy development during the fall. Now, on those other regions of the state, sometimes the planting date was also pushed late, uh, and that's probably because of a summer crop. So, for example, in uh, central Kansas, if the crop was actually following a soybean, it would have been planted uh, considerably later, three, four weeks later than a crop planted after a, a wheat crop. Similar, as we go out west, we're seeing an increase in corn acres, and so uh, a lot of the fields are actually planted after corn, and that pushed planting dates later than the optimum. And this photo is just an example here of uh, in December, how would the crop look like if it was planted early versus late October? And that gives us an idea of the difference in development of the crop uh, in phenology as well. So we see how much further along the earlier planted crop was compared to the late planted. The, the big reason why I'm bringing this up is uh, because this is a good segue into the next topic that I wanna talk about uh, in uh, for this year's crop, which was a freeze event, uh, actually several consecutive freeze events that happened during April. See that these crops that were planted in different uh, sowing dates, probably because of different crop rotations, they actually had they, they actually had different stages of development. And different stages of development, they differ also in, the, in their susceptibility to cold temperatures. So usually a crop that is further along uh, it might be more susceptible to cold temperatures. Now, that's usually what we see, right? Uh, now, as you're gonna see here in a little bit, uh, as I discussed the, some of the freeze uh, assessments that we have done so far, that that was not the case this year, uh, but, but there was something interesting that we are actually learning from. So uh, back in April, we had several freeze events, one of them in April 3rd, and uh, then, on April 24th as well, oh, sorry, April 13th through April 17th. So several days there where the lowest temperatures, they, they were uh, in very damaging levels. Actually, that April 13th, uh, the coldest temperatures in Northwest Kansas, they reached as, as low as eight degrees Fahrenheit. That's about minus 13 Celsius if, if we have international folks uh, in the audience there. And that's extremely cold, right? And that's part of the reason why we're actually seeing some differences in between those crop developments. So this map that you see here is a risk assessment that uh, Eric DeWolf, Mary Knapp, uh, the Weather Data Library in Kansas and, and myself would put together. And this is based on how far along the crop was when we had those freezing temperatures and how cold was were the, the minimum temperatures observed. Uh, and finally, for how long were those temperatures sustained? And so you can see here that the central part of the state and including some north central as well and, and parts of western Kansas is where we were expecting the highest risk for, for freeze damage. Um, 
This was because of a combination, again, of a crop that perhaps were a little bit further along in development and temperatures that got as cold as eight degrees where the crop was uh, on the tillering stage. Uh, it got to about 15 degrees or so where the crop was jointing and it got, got to the lower 20s degree where the crop was at flag leaf emergence. So that's the, the map that we came up with as a risk. Now, uh, about 10 days after that freeze, uh, went out in um, trip around the state just to check for freeze damage. And as you can see here is an example of a crop in north central Kansas, where we can definitely see some freeze damage to the leaves, right? You see a yellowing, a general yellowing of that canopy, especially if you look at the photo in the upper left corner of your screen uh, and, and in the lower left corner of your screen as well. So. Um, and as we look at that first leaf coming out of the world there, it was actually damaged as well. That's a very good indication that that dealer was probably aborted. Uh, so this is an example of a crop that got planted probably on time, right? And you see here that the, the, the head relative to that leaf in the other yellow uh, box was that actually showing damage as compared to a healthy head that you see on the upper right corner. Um, in the photo there. So this is an example of a crop that was likely planted on time after a long, long-term long fallow period there. It had a very good canopy development uh, and it was showing some tillers that were damaged by cold temperatures. Now, um, as we move along, we are also visiting some of the fields that were, that were behind in development, probably because they were planted after uh, a summer crop like a soybean. And in those fields, we were actually seeing uh, much more damage. As I was mentioning before, there was a little bit uh, against what we were originally expecting because a crop that was further along has the head above the ground already. And so we would expect the cold temperatures to hit those uh, worse. And, and it did kill likely the primary tillers. Many times we were finding 20 to 40% of those primary tillers that were damaged by the cold temperatures in these conditions. But as we look here in the photo that you see now on the screen, um, these were an example of a neighboring field that, that got this very same cold temperatures, uh, but it was planted late after a soybean crop, so no field after soybean. So this very small canopy, uh, it probably allowed more wind and, and more cold temperatures probably to set a wind. And so we saw a considerable amount of damage to the leaves, as you can see on that upper right corner. Uh, those leaves were all uh, bleached back and, and really uh, damaged by the Romulo, we lost your audio. Oh, can you guys hear me again? Yeah. You're you're kind of breaking up. We, I think we can hear you again, though. Okay. Well, for some reason, it seems like it uh, logged me out both from uh, from my computer and from. Okay. Can you see the screen or? Uh... Yeah, we can see your slides, and we can hear you. You're good. Okay. Okay, so um, apologies for that. Um, seems like I was logged out of the of the Zoom meetings here. Not sure what what happened there. Okay, so uh, continuing here uh, as as we look for. So it seems like the the screen that is showing is actually again. There's a few seconds of delay, and I I will just wait for. Um, I don't think you can see the, the entire screen, can you? 
We can now, yeah. Okay, excellent. Very good. And, and this, uh, okay, so keeping up here, uh, this is an example here of where we actually seen already. Uh, this is probably a, a three weeks after the that freeze event. We're seeing quite a bit of damage to those lower leaves, but uh, the canopy was actually uh, recovering in the upper canopy, at least was, was uh, recovering. As we move forward here, what can we look for as we're looking for, for freeze damage? And whenever we're, we're looking into the, the, the fields that are more like central Kansas, a little bit further ahead there, where you can start seeing some damage to the heads, actually, if there were any, any freeze damage. And uh, we will be looking for those as we go in, in this quality tour here. So let me move forward a couple of slides here. This is a few examples here of the damage to the head, as you can see in these slides. Okay, so uh, that's, those are conditions in the fall and freeze damage. Now, moving forward to what we're seeing throughout the growing season, right? This is a precipitation summary from September 1st through today, 18th of May. And as you can see here, uh, we, we again follow that west to east gradient with uh, less precipitation in, in the west. Uh, but what calls our attention here is really the southwest portion of the state, right? They got less than uh, six inches of precipitation, sometimes less than, than, than seven or eight inches of precipitation throughout the growing season, right? And uh, this is really starting to show the uh, signs of drought stress throughout the state. How does this uh, compare to historical? Right, so if we look at this amount of precipitation that, that is on the screen now and compare that to the normal, right, where the crop should be uh, during this time, we are up to seven, and this is the map that you can see on the screen now, uh, we would be up to seven inches behind our normal precipitation. As you can see, the, the worst affected areas would be southwest Kansas, parts of west, west central Kansas, and the north central part of the state as well. So north central Kansas, uh, being quite a bit behind on where we should be compared to the normal. So we're also going to be looking for, again, signs of drought, drought, drought stress and how that's going to affect the crop. Now, how does that look like in the field? Right? We will be looking for uh, both signs of early drought stress, which perhaps haven't really impacted the crop too much at this point, and signs of more severe drought stress as well. On the early drought stress, we'll be looking for the, uh, the crop leaves that are rolling, as you can see in this picture here, right? Rolled up leaves, it has kind of like a blue discoloration to, to the leaves as well. And the lower uh, canopy is starting to turn yellow, starting to senesce because of those uh, dry conditions. Now, this photo here I took in the central part of the state, again, where we are also behind in, uh, in precipitation but nowhere near uh, where we are in, in Southwest Kansas. Actually, uh, as we go to Southwest Kansas, we have some, uh, some more severe drought stress, which actually is not only uh, resulting in rolling up of the leaves and that blue discoloration as we're talking about in this photo here, but also it's really affecting the crop growth. And so the, the, the crop is uh, quite short, uh, it really looks stunted, because of that uh, lack of precipitation in, in southwest Kansas. Uh, it has also lost, uh, lost the lower leaves, right, as you can see in these pictures here. And it has a, overall a very thin canopy. So a crop like this would have a, a very low yield potential. And uh, that's what we're trying to, to understand. Where, where, where does the crop lie right now? What's the yield potential of the crop in the different regions of the state? Uh, we're also going to be looking for um, area abandonment, trying to have an idea of where area abandonment is going to be on this year. If you think of the crop that is on the screen right now and think of what the potential for it is, uh, we can actually ask ourselves, is this worth, right? Is it worth keeping this crop or not? And for sure, many growers are actually asking themselves the question. And so uh, we're also going to be looking for uh, area abandonment and try to have an idea of fields that were already sprayed and terminated. Uh, perhaps uh, with the intent to go for a summer crop. 
which is what you can see in this picture here uh, from, again, from Southwest Kansas as well. So uh, Aaron, that wraps up my side of the presentation here. Uh, my contact is, uh, is on the screen there. So it's uh, at KSU Week, either uh, on, on Twitter or on Facebook. So at KSU Week, you'll be, you're welcome to follow me there and see what we're seeing around the state as I will be posting several updates uh, throughout the route here. Um, and that's what I had to share with you. I'll be glad, I'll be around here until the end. So uh, we'll be glad to, to take any questions. Thanks, Romlo. We'll, uh, we'll wait till the end and let folks uh, submit questions on chat and we'll try to answer as many of those as you can. If you can go back in and, and make me host, um, I think we can, we can switch over to, to Eric. Okay. Yep. I just made you host there. So, okay, let's try this. And, and sorry about the delays folks. I think we're, um, we're uh, just having some band bandwidth issues, but we'll, we'll try to get past that. So um, let's see, Eric, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me now? There you are. So you should be able to uh, start sharing your screen. Before we get to that, I've, I've done a poor job as a host here. Uh, Romlo, of course, is assistant professor of agronomy uh, and K-State Extension Wheaton Forge specialist. And this is Eric DeWolf, uh, professor of plant pathology. And uh, Eric, I'll let you uh, introduce Kelsey when you get to that point. Okay, that sounds great. Let me start my screen share here. Okay, can you see that okay, Aaron? Yes, we can. Great. All right, so we're gonna, Kelsey and I are gonna tag team this presentation. Uh, Kelsey Anderson is uh, a colleague in plant pathology and will uh, uh, be the extension wheat pathologist uh, here going forward. So we're really excited to have Kelsey on, on board here. And um, we're gonna try and cover a, a number of talk, uh, topics here for the next few minutes. Uh, as we look at uh, what to expect uh, on your wheat quality tour. And then also uh, just uh, as we finish out the wheat growing season. So we want to be uh, giving you an update on, on maybe what we're seeing as far as disease scouting reports, um, uh, particularly what we're seeing on, on stripe rust, leaf rust right now throughout the Great Plains region, but uh, particularly here in Kansas, things you may uh, encounter firsthand uh, while you're out uh, scouting for uh, the crop and, and evaluating the, the yield potential. And then we also want to uh, talk just briefly about uh, a number of other diseases uh, that you uh, may encounter or, or uh, may ultimately impact the, the yield potential of the crop uh, in, the, in the end of the, the season. Uh, so we'll talk uh, finally about uh, how some of the things that, that Romulo has presented about precipitation and how that influences the, the diseases that you'll likely encounter also. So uh, let's dive in here and we're going to talk for a few moments about stripe rust. And uh, if you remember, stripe rust, I think many of you would be familiar from uh, prior experience, but if you're not, uh, some of these rust diseases uh, take their name from uh, the rust-colored powdery spores that they produce uh, on the surface of, of leaves. So this is a, one of the more common foliar diseases in the state. This particular disease is also called yellow rust in many parts of the world, and it often has a more yellow or orange discoloration. Each infection of the the stripe rust is able to invade the plant and grow within the plant, uh, or what we call systemic growth, but it's not able to grow over the leaf uh, veins very well. Remember the, the leaf veins in wheat grow uh, parallel to the leaf edges, and uh, as a result, we end up with these long uh, rectangular or stripe type appearance to, to this particular rust type of lesion. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if you started to pick up some of the stripe rust as you're evaluating. It seems like in, in some areas of the state, stripe rust has been active for, for several weeks uh, as well. For some reason, it doesn't want to advance, guys. All right, so uh, this is back in the, the first week of May. Uh, we started to get our reports of, of stripe rust. 
And uh, it seems like the South Central area at that time was uh, where we uh, often historically will pick up striped rust first and the 2020 growing season was no exception to that with uh, maybe uh, Reno, Sedgwick, and Sumner County being the first. Uh, but by uh, uh, the end, close of that same day on May 1st, we also had reports from um, Pratt and Collie County and, and Meade County and, and over in the Southeast in Montgomery County. So you notice the colors on the map here. Green is places where uh, K-State research and extension uh, agents or others have been scouting for disease and have uh, reported that, uh, that no disease was, was found. Uh, and then areas shown in yellow are places where the disease was detected in the low to mid canopy. Uh, and that's an important when it comes to the uh, yield loss. If the disease remains restricted to the lower canopy, it's not much of a threat to the yield uh, potential of the crop. But if it moves to the upper leaves, that's when we often start to see problems with uh, loss of yield potential. Those upper leaves or the flag leaf, if you remember Romulo's description, are responsible to uh, from around 70 to 80 percent of the ultimate uh, yield potential of the crop. So let's advance in a, another uh, few days here. And you notice now that we're starting to pick up some stripe rust in uh, the uh, a little further north into Saline, Dickinson, and, and Gary County, a little further north in the, the southwest as well. Uh, we now have Meade and Ford County, uh, where we were about uh, uh, 10 days ago. You can see it, it up and, and continuing to, to spread as well, uh, a little further north. And then uh, just this last week, you know, we started to pick up some of the stripe rust and moving to the upper leaves now in the south central and uh, central portion of the state. Notice that uh, there was some kind of patchy distribution. There's a, a patch in that south central area, but also uh, we were able to find stripe rust uh, uh, to our surprise a little bit up in, in Jewell County as well. Uh, right uh, bordering the Nebraska border. So it kind of jumps around a little bit. So generally expanding the area and uh, a few uh, patches where it's already moving to the upper portion of the leaves, uh, upper portion of the canopy, which remember is so important to the yield potential of our crop and the potential for damage. So we also have been experiencing some changes in the stripe rust population. Uh, it appears that some of our more widely grown varieties or, or up and coming varieties uh, things like Larry, LCS Chrome, SY Monument, and Zenda uh, are uh, previously thought to be genetically resistant to the disease, but in 2019, we started to uh, see evidence that some of these things were uh, uh, now becoming much more susceptible. We're also uh, 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 expecting that the disease may continue to increase in portions of the state that have experienced um, more moisture in, in uh, this past seven to 10 days in that uh, central portion of the state. Uh, keep in mind that uh, it's not necessarily a matter of uh, soil moisture as much as it is high relative humidity or dew in the case of stripe rust. It just requires free moisture or dew on the surface of the leaves in order to get the next generation of the fungus into the plant. So in areas with higher moisture, we might expect uh, higher yield potential, but also a higher disease risk for diseases like stripe rust and a few other things that, that Kelsey will mention here in a moment. So here's another look at uh, some of the, the overall uh, area where we might expect some of the um, diseases to be worse. Uh, and I think you'll notice that the area here shown in the U.S. Drought Monitor where there's uh, no uh, lack of, of moisture in the, the east and portions of, of the south central and, and extending into the central or maybe just that uh, D0 or abnormally dry or where we're starting to see some evidence of, of stripe rust taking hold. But it's largely uh, not uh, spreading into areas that are either at moderate or severe drought uh, as are shown in the yellow or orange. So uh, here I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague Kelsey and uh, give her a chance to uh, talk about a number of diseases as well. So uh, Aaron, if we can uh, make Kelsey also a host. Oh, yes, right. I've, I've made her co-host, so she should be able okay. to share here. Great, great.
and you still are muted, Kelsey. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Whoops. I got to the end there uh, of my, my slide deck here. Okay. So thanks, Eric. Um, thanks for including me in this. Hi, everybody. I'm Kelsey Anderson. Like Eric said, I'm the new extension plant pathologist um, for Wheat and Forges. So I'm really excited to be here and, um, and right in the middle of wheat season. So that's, that's exciting for me. Um, a little bit about me. So I, um, I came here from the University of Florida. So I have a PhD in plant pathology um, and a master's in plant pathology also from Ohio State and then a, a bachelor's in um, biology. And I did spend some time in private industry as well. So I worked for three years um, for a company that was Monsanto, it's now Bayer. So that's your um, DeKalb Asgro channel brand Westbred um, uh, breeding programs. So please feel free. I would love to get to know you. Um, reach me by email or you can get me on Twitter at KSU Wheat Disease. So Eric mentioned um, stripe rust and that's been a big problem that we've seen um, that should be emerging too over these next couple of weeks. So it's really important to keep an eye out for that. Um, and I wanted to go through just a couple of other diseases. So here's one um, that's called Steptoria leaf blotch. So there's a few um, important fungal diseases that can cause blotches or spots on um, the leaves of wheat. And typically, you'll first notice them in the lower canopy. Um, and so this particular one, Septoria, is characteristic. It has these, these black fruiting bodies within the lesion. So you can really tell it apart from some others like tan spot or, um, or bacterial problems, for example, or freeze injury. Um, and this one we've seen a little bit crop up in central Kansas. I think some of it got burned down by, by that freeze event that happened, but this is another one like Eric mentioned, that if it um, occurs on your upper leaves or especially on that flag leaf, you can start to see some yield loss. So um, it's important early season and can also be yield limiting, so it's good to watch out for. Now like a, a handful of these um, leaf spot or leaf blotch diseases, this can be particularly problematic when you have um, residue in your field. So if it's, uh, for example, wheat on wheat, you can have a lot of that fungus that survives over the winter and can cause a problem if the environment is favorable in the next season. So that's something to, to definitely keep an eye out for. Um, another disease that we have heard some reports of, although not severe this year uh, yet, at least that I've heard of, let us know if, if, um, if you find some, some leaf rust, that would be interesting. So leaf rust, um, unlike stripe rust, will cause a, a darker lesion. So you'll see they're darker orange, um, typically will occur all, all over the surface of the leaf or in one or two pustules. They're not limited by the veins of the leaves. So they don't form those yellow stripes. So that's a good way to tell them apart from, um, from leaf rust. Um, and they, this particular rust can cause um, damage too, though, some yield loss, especially again in the upper canopy. So it's really important um, to protect that flag leaf uh, with, with potentially a fungicide application if this is getting bad enough in a field. Um, also, with, there's some good host resistance available, so that's something to consider for, for leaf rust. Um, and another um, now virus, so we've talked about fungal diseases and there are some important viral diseases of wheat too. Um, we've been seeing a good amount of wheat streak mosaic virus. We saw some last week in uh, north central Kansas. So this one um, is, is pretty dramatic. It causes some, some yellow streaking on leaves. It'll, usually you'll see the yellowing start at the tip of the leaf um, and, and move down. And um, sometimes it can be confused with other viruses. So we do have a diagnostic service um, through the plant pathology department. It's the plant disease diagnostic clinic. So if you're at all concerned, you can always send a sample our way. Um, this one is actually vectored by a tiny mite. So a tiny mite will pick this virus up from maybe um, volunteer wheat that has, um, that's near the field or has survived and it can move this virus into the field 
and then move it around kind of like a mosquito might move malaria around it can pick it up and move it from plant to plant so so that can be um, a problem with volunteer wheat and, and some weeds so one that so all of the diseases we've talked about so far can infect the wheat crop um, pretty much from planting but from from tillering through flowering and can cause yield loss on that that flag leaf now one um, that can be problematic in Kansas, especially Eastern and Central Kansas, um, is Fusarium head blight. And this one, unlike rust or septoria or um, some of these viral diseases, has only one specific time that it can infect a wheat head. So when the wheat is flowering, that's the, the only time that um, wheat is susceptible. So there's this short window where the fungus, spores from the fungus can, um, can infect through those flowering anthers uh, on your wheat um, head. And, and then it basically, it sneaks up on you. So you won't see symptoms for maybe um, three weeks afterwards. And that symptom will um, typically be some bleaching of the head that will start from, from where you have infection and can move, um, move up or down. So it's important that if, if it is a high risk situation, so you've um, planted wheat into a, a no-till um, environment or a, a limited till environment. Um, the problem with Fusarium head blight is it's also a pathogen of corn. Um, this, this particular fungal pathogen can affect corn and it can also affect soybeans. So even in a rotation, um, it can still be a problem. So, um, so if, if there is no host plant resistance and um, the weather is really favorable, it's probably good to protect your flowering wheat with a fungicide. So it's best to apply that fungicide at flowering, but if there's some, some window of, um, of error there, so you can apply it a little later um, or a little earlier and it can still be pretty effective. And um, one great resource that's a collaborative effort between Kansas State and um, Penn State and Ohio State and a few other institutions is this um, risk model. So this basically takes into account the, um, the weather in the couple weeks leading up to flowering and you can go in and you can say if you have a resistant variety or not you can use this little button here and um, put in some more specific information and you can determine your um, your environmental risk for fusarium head blight so that's at wheatscab.psu.edu and what we've been noticing here is that there is um, pretty good environmental risk if you have a susceptible variety planted in um, south and central Kansas. So um, if it's a, it seems to be right now around flowering and there is high risk, so it's important to consider um, the genetics you have and then, and then at that point we might recommend a fungicide. So those are some of the, that's what I've got here, I think, um, every week. Um, or, or typically every week, there's um, an agronomy e-update that is um, published by K-State Research and Extension. So we've been trying to keep that updated with real-time disease information. So please um, keep your eye out on that and feel free to reach out to us with any, any questions or concerns. Okay, thank you very much, Kelsey and Eric. Appreciate the update. Um, just a couple uh, more housekeeping things here and uh, we'll, we'll take some questions as, as, times allow, as time allows. Uh, let's see if we can get back to um, my slides here again. Okay. Um, the latest crop condition report uh, came out this afternoon and um, we actually did improve a little bit. Um, on our crop condition by a point in Kansas, 34% uh, good and 6% excellent. Uh, so that may be owed to the fact of, of uh, some of the rains that we had recently. Um, so here's the formula that we have provided. Again, this is provided by USDA uh, Ag Statistics that we um, give to the volunteers who go out and look at the field. So basically, they go out into the field, uh, take a yardstick, um, count the number of tillers or stalks per foot, and then enter it into this formula, and that will calculate the number of heads for you uh, in that 12 inches. Then they plug it into this yield formula, uh, and that will tell um, the results of the yield forecast for that field. 
Now, what probably is going to be the case this year is that we're going to be using or seeing a lot more of the late season formula. Um, this is applied where the fields have completely headed out um, and uh, they can count the heads. And it's also to advantage um, that they might be able to see uh, freeze damage, as Romulo explained, a little bit more pronounced and be a, able to eliminate those heads. But they actually do go in and count the spikes uh, and spikelets within a wheat head. And this diagram kind of illustrates that. So it's a little bit more in depth and uh, to be honest, a little bit more precise in predicting the yield um, when the wheat is fully headed. So um, again, finally, this is the USDA production report that came out last week. They're forecasting Kansas at 306 million bushels, which is down 10% from last year. Um, so in a sense, to figure out the, the crop total for the state or any state of Kansas or any state, it's very simple. You start with the number of planted acres. Uh, you estimate how much of those will be abandoned uh, due to bad weather or just not harvested. Uh, then you estimate a statewide average yield per bushel and multiply that times harvested acres and that will get you your total crop production number. And that's the kind of number we'll try to come uh, back to you with on Thursday afternoon. So uh, we'll be doing this seminar every day at four o'clock for the next three days. It's the same Zoom link that you use to access the meeting today. Uh, the password is required. The password is 402517 uh, if you want to join us the next few days. Uh, follow on, on Twitter. Uh, hashtag Wheat Tour 20 is the, uh, the tag you want to follow. And then the Kansas Wheat account uh, is just simply at Kansas Wheat. Um, so with that, I think we'll um, just go to um, questions right now for um, anyone who might have questions for any of the panelists, um, whether that's Romlo or Eric or Kelsey or even myself, uh, we've got my colleague Marsha uh, kind of monitoring the, the chat here and also also look at that too. So at this point in time, if, if anybody has any questions, just send those to us via chat or um, maybe we did enough talking already. Uh, the video recording from each of these sessions will be posted um, later, um, probably on the Kansas Week YouTube channel. Uh, we'll notify you when we know where that's going to be. And um, we'll also probably post the slides, make available the slides that we've had from each of our presentations also. Any final comments uh, from either Kelsey or Eric? Or Romlo, uh, we got a comment from Jan who says in South Central Kansas, stripe rust in the wheat at a low level. At what point is stripe rust in flag leaf not a concern? Eric or Kelsey might want to handle that one. So I unmuted Aaron. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So if I follow the question there, you know, we're we're kind of uh, looking at a situation uh, right now where a lot of growers are evaluating if they're going to apply a fungicide or not. And in some situations, uh, it could be uh, too late uh, and the disease can, can cause a lot of damage to those upper leaves that are so important to yield. And um, even an application of fungicide wouldn't uh, uh, allow us to recover that yield. But there's also the reverse uh, scenario that uh, maybe this question is getting at, where the, the disease is uh, uh, not able to, to uh, cause damage early enough in the growth and development of the, of the wheat crop to cause much yield loss. And uh, that might be what they're getting at with, with that particular question. So if the disease appears to be at low levels, uh, say it stays in the low canopy or, or just barely makes it to the, the upper uh, canopy, um, by the late milk or uh, even dough stages of development. And in that case, uh, the crop is pretty well made and uh, wouldn't be much uh, a threat to the yield potential anymore. So it really is this balance, uh, almost a race to the finish now. If a grower elects not to use a fungicide, will, they, uh, uh, will the disease get bad enough uh, to cause yield loss? A lot of that depends on the weather conditions they'll experience over the next few weeks. 
Uh, if the disease uh, gets a foothold, things stay cool and moist. The very same things that favor our yield potential of our crop will also favor the disease. If it gets hotter and drier, uh, the disease will likely be suppressed as well. So hopefully that gives you a, a little more uh, food for thought as you're evaluating the, the risk for stripe rust as you travel around. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, question here, how many kernels per spikelet should we use since we don't know yet? Um, so that's a reference to the spikelets I showed you that the kernels haven't filled in yet. So this is obviously a, a question for Romulo. Hi, Aaron. Yeah, that, that's actually a good question. We, we'll be kind of counting spikelets, but we don't know how many uh, kernels we'll have there, right? So uh, if we think of the, the wheat head, many times on that middle, middle portion of the head where uh, flowering starts earlier, uh, we might have, depending on the variety, right, we might have three up to five sometimes. And then as we go up or down in that spikelet, we're going to have less and less, so, so many, as many as one perhaps in the top. Or, or even in the bottom. So I think many times uh, kind of starting on that probably two and a half more or less should, should put us in the ballpark. If, uh, if a crop is looking really good and, and in good conditions, I'll probably bump it up a little bit, 2.83. If it's looking very stressed, you know, drought stress, I'll probably uh, go down a bit a little bit towards that too. But remember, we're not only counting the, one, the ones in the middle where we can see many times four or, or, or even more. Uh, so I would not go that high. I'll probably keep it between two and three, depending on the crop conditions there. Uh, Aaron, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I've typically gone with the, the two and a half number. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a safe bet, especially if the, if the crops just started heading. So I think, yeah, you're spot on with that. So, um, Okay, last call for questions. Doesn't look like we have too many coming in. So um, again, I wanna thank our, our speakers this afternoon. Romulo is gonna be hitting the road tomorrow morning and out there in the field doing some of these yield assessments himself. I know Eric and Kelsey just got back. So we've got uh, a lot of eyes out there on the road in the field. So uh, thanks everybody for joining us. We hope uh, you can jump on here uh, at least once during the next three days and we'll try to provide you uh, with a great update as we go along. Otherwise, uh, we'll end this and uh, have a very good evening.